So, so uh, tonight I want to talk to you about your spiritual gift. Now we're not talking about Tom's spiritual gift or Harry's spiritual gift or Susan's spiritual gifts. We're talking about your spiritual gifts. So turn around and tell somebody uh, he's talking about my spiritual gift. Amen? Mine. Now what, now what Pastor Jerry is preaching on is available to all of us at any time as our faith level and as the opportunity meet together, uh, then you could possibly give an utterance in tongues. I pray you do. You could possibly interpret tongues. You possibly uh, could give a word of prophecy. Uh, you possibly could uh, have the gift of faith or the gift of healing, the miracles. All of those are different, and uh, any one of us can flow in that. But the gifts in Romans chapter 12 are more personal. Uh, you have one or one of these gifts, uh, and if you don't have one of these gifts, then there's other ways that God wants to use you as well. Now, we're not talking about natural talent. Uh, it may come close. I've always felt like I've had a natural talent at public speaking, and uh, I, was, uh, I was in debate club when I was uh, in a senior in high school, and I was on my way to winning uh, a debate tournament, tournament here I can't talk about speaking I can't even say the, say the word but uh, I was on my way in Raleigh in my senior year and uh, man I was going to win there was no question about it I was going on to the state and uh, it snowed out and they didn't reschedule it and I, I tell you what it was what, such a downer but uh, I had a I had a speech uh, ready and I have felt like that in, in fact uh, when I worked at Kmart my job uh, was to be the blue light operator, and you had to get on the intercom and, you know, say, attention Kmart shoppers, and you had to do it in a way to get people there, and I, I passed that. I did that. But listen, these spiritual gifts that I'm talking about, they may be closely tied to your natural talents, but they're not always mean you have natural talents. God can use you despite your natural talents. Sometimes he, he does allow that. And my, one of my examples is Steve Edmondson. He's one of the greatest preachers that I know of. But if you get a, used to when he was younger, especially, he couldn't hardly talk. Him, him, he just didn't know how to talk. He was just very introverted. So God gives gifts, and we can make a difference. Can you say amen tonight? Uh, now, 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, and I'm not started preaching yet. I'm still just uh, feeling my way here. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, I would not have you to be ignorant. We, we, so many are ignorant of spiritual gifts. And that's bad. But I don't think we at Westmoreland are ignorant. We can't be. Not after having a pastor as we have to teach and preach on these. I think the problem is not so much that we're ignorant of spiritual gifts. I feel like maybe that our spiritual gifts are dormant. We're not ignorant, but they're dormant. They're there, but we've yet to walk into the gateway. And really, God wants our spiritual gifts to be rampant. He wants us to all prophesy, to all speak in tongues, all minister, and all make a difference. When we do, lives are changed. Destinies are altered. The church grows internally. The church grows externally when we become difference makers. In fact, one of the great Puritan writers, John Owen, he wrote, that, and this is in the 1600s, he wrote that spirit, 1600s, he wrote, that was for cell phones and Trinity Broadcasting Network. He said, he said that spiritual gifts are that without which the church cannot subsist in the world nor can believers be useful to one another and the rest of mankind to the glory of Christ as they ought to be. They, talking about spiritual gifts, are the powers of the world to come, those effectual operations of the power of Christ whereby his kingdom is erected and is preserved. And I think that is an awesome definition of what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, build his kingdom where his kingdom is erected and where his kingdom is preserved in the power of his spirit. I want you to stand with me tonight and read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Romans chapter 12, and this is where I've been preaching from over the last few weeks and last few months since we've been talking about the gateway. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And if you're there, would you say amen? amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So if you think you're... Uh, not perfect enough or good enough to be used in the spiritual gifts, please know it's all by His mercy. Amen? Um, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You don't have to present your offering. Talking about money. You don't have to present your talent, uh, what you can do or can't do. You just present yourself 
a living sacrifice, holy. Now, you need to be holy, striving for holiness, acceptable unto God, which is your logical or reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't act like the world. Um, and, and the word conformed, uh, one translator says, don't be squeezed into the mold of the world. Some of you have made cookies, and you've got the cookie mold where it makes little uh, Santa Clauses or little... Um, uh, gingerbread fellow, you know, there's a mold there. And so we got to be careful that the world doesn't mold us in our thinking and our singing and our, and our, our, our um, work for the Lord. And be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me that every man that is among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man, every man in the body of Christ and woman, the measure of faith. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the what? So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts different. So your gifting is different than mine. According to how the grace that is given to us whether prophecy, that's what I'm talking about. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. Uh, our ministry, that's number two. Let us wait upon our ministry. Or he that teacheth, that's number three, on teaching. Or he that exhorteth or encourages on your encouragement. He that, uh, that's number four. Number five, he that giveth, let him do it uh, with generosity. Uh, number six, he that ruleth or leadeth, do it with diligence. And then the last one, he that showeth mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Father, help us tonight to make a difference in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. And turn around and tell somebody you can make a difference. Amen. I want you to give the Lord a hand of praise again tonight. I like to clap our hands unto the Lord. Amen. Now, it didn't start out this way, but about the third message into it, I came up with a three outline for each one of these ministry, body ministry gifts. I talked about them generically, I talked about them specifically, and I talked about them structurally. And I didn't realize with those three for each one, I could do a whole series of messages that could go months and months and weeks and weeks. But just remember, generically, say the word generically. All of these gifts, prophecy or preaching, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, and mercy, all of these gifts, prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, uh, um, and uh, mercy, uh, all of these gifts are, uh, gen can be used and appropriated in the generic sense of the word. For example, when it comes to the body ministry gift of giving. There are some people called, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, to give. But really, we're all to be givers. Amen? And so, generically speaking, all of these. So don't tune me out when I'm preaching on the specific. Well, that's not me. I'm not really called to be uh, a preacher. So I'm not going to say anything. No, we're, there's a sense we should all uh, in a sense, preach the gospel everywhere we go. They went everywhere preaching the word. Preach the word on the job. Preach the word in the, in the marketplace. Uh, uh, you don't have to have an ordination certificate to be a witness. So I talked about the generic sense of these. I talked about the structural. Now that I really didn't have a time to get into. But all seven of these, I could teach you and say, if, you, if your body ministry is the gift of, of uh, encouraging, I could give you some things to help you encourage. See, this is the difference between the body ministry gifts that I'm talking about and the manifestation gifts that Pastor Jerry is talking about. Because the manifestation gifts, you really don't practice. You don't rehearse. You don't, you don't get a book out. You don't improve upon it. It is just a manifestation to a willing vessel in the moment where God gets even greater glory because there's no way you can really add to or take away from it. Amen? But in all of these seven gifts I'm talking to you about, structurally, uh, they must be improved upon. In fact, there is a scripture that I thought I would uh, mention, and that is to stir up the gift 
that is within you. Or fan into flame the gift. That's what Paul uh, told Timothy in uh, chapter 1, verse 6. He said, kindle, here's one translation, kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you. And God has called Ricky Nelms to preach. Uh, and I am, I am listening to other preachers. I am reading books. Uh, I am uh, on my knees praying every day. Uh, I'm sitting under other preachers. And, and uh, I'm taking classes. And I'm learning more theological truths. Uh, and that only blesses you because what I learn and what I discover, praise God, I can preach with power and liberty and information for transformation. And God does amazing things because I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be a better preacher than I was last year. I'm trying to be a better preacher than I was, uh, you know, five years ago. I'm trying to be. I'm. Somebody said, "What's your greatest sermon that you have ever preached?" It's the one I'm getting ready to do next. Right? <laughs> so I said, what's your favorite book other than the Bible? It's the book I'm getting ready to read in a few, a few days from now. Amen. And, uh, and please don't look at me as, and, and this is where I fear. And I fear some people say, oh, Brother Ricky, he's so smart. He's, I am not that smart. I promise you I'm smart enough to marry Darnell. Amen. I was smart enough to go to East Carolina, and uh, I, I was smart enough to say yes to Pastor Jerry when he asked me to come. But listen, let me tell you something. I'm not. I'm just average intelligence. My SAT scores were 800. Come on, I did not qualify for Yale or for Duke. Amen. Uh, I, my uh, IQ is about. I ain't gonna tell you what it is. It's, it's average. All right. Uh, I'm just your average Joe, but I tell you what, I love to learn, and I love to read, and I love to glorify God. Uh, um, I was uh, Pastor Teal Bird. I didn't like to read when I was younger. I, I detested it. I hated it. I would, when we had to read those crazy books in English literature, I didn't read them. I read the Cliff Notes, and, and I just, I, just uh, thumb, I didn't read the first book that I was supposed to read in, in high school, All Quiet on the Western Front, 1984, Brave, Brave New World. I didn't read that mess. I hated it. I, just, I couldn't stand reading. I went to college, and man, they wanted you to read, and English 101, I couldn't stand it. And I remember uh, when Pastor Bird asked me to come as his associate pastor, and, and we went to lunch uh, after church one Sunday, and I had just started there, September of 91. I hadn't even, I uh, just had met Darnell a few months earlier, and, uh, and I was going to preach that night. So he said, you can go up to my study. And I'd never been to his study. And he, his study was upstairs in his house. And I remember walking upstairs, and I, he had a whole room full of books. I never saw that many books outside of a library. It just blew my mind. And I remember sitting at his desk, and I turned around, and I reached where hands, hand, the hand reached. The, I picked the book up that my hand reached. I thought, well, that, this must be, you know, the closest book. And I remember putting it in front of my desk, and I read one chapter and from that day to this day, I've never put down a book. That book was A.W. Tozer's book of God and men. Go check it out. Of God and men. I read one chapter. It changed my life. And I've never put books down because I learned that I can learn through those, through those materials. I'm trying to structurally get better so that I can do even greater for the Lord. And as we study to show ourselves, if you're a Sunday school teacher, you need to improve on your teaching. You don't need to just teach the same way with the same stuff, the same cliches, the same illustrations, the same information. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge patience and to patience brotherly kindness. Uh, see that you come behind in no gift. And, and if you're a Sunday school teacher, come up with uh, fresh stuff uh, for your people. And, and, uh, and if you're, whatever you're doing, uh, if you're singers, I do encourage you. Learn new material. Learn new songs. Uh, don't just have one, two, or three that you sing over and over again. Is it, does it bless us? Of course it does. Uh, you sing Amazing Grace a thousand times, you're going to get a thousand blessings. Nothing wrong with it. Amen? But whatever gift God has given to you, improve upon it. And God's not just going to throw it at your lap. Some people, we Pentecostals, that's one of our mistakes is we think, oh, well, we're so spiritual, we just wait for God to do it. Let me tell you something. Those apostles, uh, they waited for 40 days, and after that, they stopped waiting. Praise God, they took everything by the gates of hell. They didn't wait for nothing. Uh, brother, they took the world by storm. Uh, yes, we should tarry. Yes, we should wait in prayer. But God has already told us, uh, he's, he said, I've equipped you. Uh, I've given you these gifts. Uh, 
Now you take it uh, and you make it and I'll bless it as you go forward. Uh, and somebody give him praise for it here tonight. Amen. Structurally. Amen. By the way, none of that was on my notes. I studied, but see, God just gave it to me. So you can't, you can't say Pastor Ricky had an agenda. Uh, my agenda was to say, Lord, I've studied. I've put my notes together. I've prepared. I've thought it out. Now, Lord, it's yours. I'm a living sacrifice. I could throw these notes aside and keep right on preaching tonight if that's what God wants me to do. People talk about, well, uh, your, your sermon has too many points. Have you ever heard a preacher's sermon that didn't have any point? <laughs> So, if they got too many points, just be thankful there's at least one good point. Amen. So, you love God, say amen. amen. Let's talk about those gifts, and then I want to close, and I want to impart to you spiritual gifts. I want to stir up the gifts in you. Amen. I want you to improve upon those gifts. I want you to stretch out and step out on those gifts. God's got some awesome things for all of us. Can you say amen? Look at uh, preaching, prophecy. Um, we talked about the word prophecy. Now, prophecy is in both lists. There's the manifestation gift of prophecy. That's like Johnny Chase said in Stantonsburg, Pentecost Honest Church. God told him to tell, him, tell the church that if there was a person there, that if they would quit smoking cigarettes, that God would fill them with the Holy Spirit. And Johnny Chase said, I was only 16 years old, and I was scared to death. He said, I knew I was supposed to say it. He said, but I didn't say it. He said, but somebody across the other side of the church stood up and said, there's somebody here bound by cigarettes, and if you'll put those cigarettes down, bless God, I'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. And boom, revival hit the church. So that's the manifestation gift of prophecy. You, didn't, you, you can't study and think, well, next Sunday night, I'm going to tell the church that somebody needs to quit smoking cigarettes. Now, yeah, God could lay that on your heart that, that early, but I'm talking about usually it's in the moment. Somebody say, in the moment. That's prophecy. But on my list of gifts, prophecy can also refer to and more likely refers to the prepared message. And what is prepared prophecy what's a better word for it preaching that's what i'm doing tonight i'm prophesying to you but in the prepared mode right uh, one is unplanned the other is planned one is a shorter message like a word of prophecy is just that a word of prophecy a word in season but but one is a shorter message the other is a more expositional message one is a surprise the other is the work of a lifetime one is special revelation one is the revela a proclamation of already revealed information. Uh, it has the literal meaning of speaking forth, um, not with the connotation of prediction, uh, but the gift of proph prophecy is simply the gift of preaching. The gift of prophecy does not pertain to the content, but rather to the means of the proclamation. In our day, it is active enablement to proclaim God's word already written in the scriptures. Paul gives no distinction to this gift among the other six, which are clearly ongoing gifts in the church, does not limit it to just special revelation. Now, on this list, on the seven-point li list, Preaching or prophecy comes first, and it's not an accident because there's nothing more effective, more powerful, more influential, uh, more determining to a destiny than the God-called preacher. You know, we have to pray for preachers because the, the devil fears preachers. That's really what the election is all about coming up. You know where we're headed to. We, we are headed at breakneck speed to silencing pulpits. I want to remind you that about seven or eight years ago, the mayor of Houston, because their city passed homosexual laws that you could not speak against homosexuals, that if you did, you were under, uh, you were, you, you're going to be, it was crime. And so all of those churches within the city limits of Houston, she demanded that the pastors give her their manuscripts of their sermons and for her or her team to see if they were preaching against homosexuality now everybody laughed it off she lost in court everybody just kind of derided it 
Listen to me. It's coming, and it's coming faster than you realize. We better pray that God puts down Mayor Pete because Mayor Pete is anointed of hell. He's an, and I'll tell you something. He's, it's like the Antichrist. Smooth talk, very polished, and people have fall to that stuff. Uh, and so we, our president is vulnerable, and our cause is vulnerable. And, friend, if you think you're going to sit at home and say, well, God's going to take care of this, uh, you're going to be standing accountable on the day of judgment. People say, well, are we against homosexuals? We are not against people who struggle with sin. And, if, and here's the thing. It is a sin. But the point I'm trying to tell you is it's coming to the point where they're going to try to silence the preacher in the pulpit. Even in churches like ours, even in little cities like Wilson and Sims and Bailey, they're going to be police to check in. They're going to listen to our YouTubes. Already, if you put certain stuff on Facebook, they'll ban you. They banned Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham was banned on Facebook already in England where his father went in 1955 and turned that country around. Many churches were planted. Many hundreds of thousands of souls were saved. Even the queen herself had a personal audience. Winston Churchill himself uh, received Billy Graham and Billy Graham led him to the Lord uh, I'm telling you in 1955 uh, that Billy Graham took England uh, and now they won't even let Franklin come because they said he's against gay people and by the way England is the mother country what's happened there is just a prediction of what's coming here so preacher preach preachers preach the best you can preach get anointed before God get in that book get in the word of God lift up the sound your voice like a trumpet and those of you sitting out there your calling is not to preach your calling is to amen the preacher stand behind the man of God lift up the man of God because we need preaching like never before people people make crazy statements I tell you it just Gets under my skin. They're talking about, well, we've had all the preaching in the world to save the world, and we don't need to preach anymore. We need to sit on a coffee table and sip coffee and cross our legs and have a co conversation with people. People don't like being preached at anymore. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We ought to boldly, loudly, with love. And I'm not talking about screaming and just, I'm talking about having good, solid preaching moves the world. Let the preacher preach. Somebody give the Lord a hand of praise here tonight. Amen. <laughs> what about Billy Graham and D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon and others, Jonathan Edwards? The gift of, are you called to preach? Now, if you're not called to preach, please don't try. You don't want to do it. Why would you want to do it? You really want to be a preacher? I mean, think about what preachers have to put up with. Right? It's not easy being a preacher. That's why we have pastor appreciation. It's not like you clock it. When I go to Best Buy, I clock in at 9, I clock out at 5, and I don't see them fellas no more don't want to see them. Right? Preachers don't clock in and clock out. Preachers are clocked on. Their clock out is glory. Amen? And preachers carry the weight of, of, of the church and finances and souls and lives. And so if you're called to preach, give it all you got. If you're not called to preach, then maybe you're one of the other gifts that we have listed here. So let's go to the next one. Not only is there the gift or the calling of preaching, but there's also the gift or calling to ministry or serving. Somebody say the word serving. Now remember, there's a generic sense and we should all serve. But this is a absolute calling to serve the second spiritual gift is service it's all it's the same word we get the word deacon from service is simple a simple straightforward gift that is broad in its application it seems to carry a meaning similar to that of the gift gift of helps in first you ever heard of the gift of helps in first corinthians 12 and 28 uh that's sort of what we're talking about here uh deacons deaconesses servants uh, uh the Paul told the uh, elders to help the weak in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. The gift or the calling to service is manifested in every sort of practical help that gives each other's help in the name of Jesus. There are some people, they're not called, their calling is not to stand in the pulpit and preach. Their calling is to serve the body of Christ, is to be a servant to the world how about James Dobson? He's, I believe, called to serve. 
You may not be familiar with James Dobson, but he is, uh, his daddy was a preacher. His granddaddy was a preacher. All of his brothers were preachers. And he was the only one that didn't feel the call to preach. But he felt a calling to, to help families. And he also had a gift and a desire for technology. And so he got on the radio. He was ahead of his time. Um, before the age of podcasts, before the age of YouTube, he was on hundreds of radio stations. And his program was called Focus on the Family. And he wrote books about how to be a better husband and, and different things. And that's a service. That's a help. Amen. We need people in the body of Christ who will serve and who will help in different areas. Uh, the Kendrick brothers, uh, those movies they've produced. You ever seen the movie Facing the Giants? Have you seen the last movie, The Overcomer? Have you seen it? Raise your hand if you've seen it. All righty. Man, did that movie bless my socks off. It sure did. Because... It talked about redemption. It talked about so many things. And, and the Kendrick brothers, they're not preachers. They're called to serve. They're serving and making movies that people have gotten saved to and, and responded to. Uh, I thought about uh, a man that I met at uh, Best Buy. And he, uh, he, he attended a, one of our Pentecostal holiness churches, a large church. And uh, he said, he, said I, he told me, he said, I... I know the pastor, and, and I told the pastor that I'm going to do anything I can, but don't pay me. Don't pay me. I want to do it because I love the Lord and I love the church. Now, friends, there's nothing wrong with paying those who serve among us full time. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the Bible teaches that we should pay their, the laborers are worthy of their hire. We're going to pay those who, who do our church cleaning because, you know, volunteer church cleaning is okay. But your definition of clean. And my definition of clean might not be the same. And we don't want to cross hairs over, over, over a speck of dust. Can I get a witness out there? And our pastor is, it for, is an ex-Marine. And uh, we, we just good for us to just pay somebody to do it. Can I get a witness out there? Uh, and that way we can hold them accountable and, you know, go back and do it. Y'all looking like Nancy Pelosi out there. I see y'all. <laughs> I see those expressions on your face. <laughs> um. Now, your gift may be cleaning, and if you want to volunteer and clean, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure those who get paid will be glad to help. But at the end of the day, we're going to hold them accountable. That gets them, some people need to be paid. We need to, they, we need to enumerate them for the time and the effort, and everybody said amen. But this man had a gift of serving. He said, I want to be one of those volunteers, and I want my, uh, my, my influence to be in serving there's not only the gift of preaching and the gift of serving. There's the gift of teaching. Somebody say teaching. There are those who have the gift of teaching. Now, teaching is different than the gift of preaching. Now, some people can get the two kind of mixed up. Now, all preaching is teaching. But not all teaching is preaching. But it could be. Sometimes when you're teaching, teachers tend to go more deeply into the scriptures, Sunday school teachers, more practical in their applications. Um, there are those who have the, have the mind, and we thank God for teachers. In fact, those who teach school, I want you to think about school teachers. Now, my wife's a school teacher, has been for 20-something years, uh, 18 years, I believe. It's her total years of service. And I'm going to tell you something. Those who walk into a classroom with a bunch of kids running around the classroom screaming and yelling and uh throwing uh throwing paper at each other and yawning fa falling asleep and then you got to deal with the homework and the paperwork if they do and the money and the pay is not that good i promise you it's not near as what as it should be if somebody's willing to do that i think that's a sign they're called to do it now a calling to teach moses was the greatest teacher of all he gave us Western civilization like we know it. You say, well, we're based on jurisprudence, Roman jurisprudence, you know, the way they did it. Well, who do they base theirs on? The Romans based it on the Hebrew, the Hebraic. When you hear the word Judeo-Christian, Moses taught 
the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and many of the Psalms. Uh, Solomon, we know, was a great teacher. Ezra was a priest who taught. Paul, he even said, I gave a scripture where Paul said, my gifting is to teach mainly. Uh, Terry Trammell is a great teacher. Frank Tunstall, uh, John Calvin, the reformer. Uh, who, <laughs> John Calvin, uh, you know, you get the word Calvinism from. And by the way, some people, bless their hearts, they're more Calvinist than John Calvin was. But uh, that's another story for another day. Uh, you can abuse anybody's teaching. But John Calvin got in the pulpit at Switzerland, um, and, uh, and, and he taught verse by verse every, like, Sunday morning, every Thursday morning, every uh, Sunday afternoon, every uh, and one other time, Friday night. There was, like, five times a week he taught verse by verse. So, for example, he'd start Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, He'd go down to Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, and Sunday night he'd pick up with Matthew chapter 1, verse 4, and go down to Matthew chapter 1, verse 7. And then come Tuesday morning, he'd pick up at verse 8 and go all the way through to verse 12. He did that five times a week, verse by verse, book by book, and then they banned him. They run him out of town for four years, sent him back home to France. He's from France. Say, so we don't want this guy preaching the gospel like that. His preaching was so powerful. Verse by verse. Go back. Look at your history. When they welcomed him back, the city clamored to have him back. The people said, we must have him back. When he came back, you know what his first sermon was? He picked up the next verse from where he left off the first time. That, my friend, is a teacher. Amen. <laughs> that, my friend, is a teacher. And by the way, unless you think John Calvin didn't, didn't do a lot to your life, uh, John Calvin instituted public school systems as we know it today because children were not given the right to learn. And he said, we must, as a city, he was, and people talking about Christians ought not to be in politics. That's one reason they run him out. He was, he was all over politics. Uh, he helped people get elected. Uh, he helped people get into positions. Uh, he, he did city reform. Uh, oh, my God, we've got to... Thank Thank God for people that were bold and said, we're going to make a difference, uh, even in the political realm. Amen. John Calvin was a teacher. Um, uh, let's see. Elmer Towns. Anybody ever heard of Elmer Towns? I'm telling you, read anything. He's got a book called The Names of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that the Holy Spirit, he has a book of na the names of the Holy Spirit. I preached a series on that in Smyrna, the last church I pastored, based on that book. The names of the Holy Spirit. You would be amazed at the names of the Holy Spirit. I ain't going to give them to you tonight. I want you to look them up. Amen. Elmer Towns. He taught for years at uh, Liberty University, just over the border, with Dr. Jerry Falwell. So, friends... God uses these gifts in a powerful way. Well, you say, well, I'm not Elmer Towns, and I'm not John Calvin. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you're a school teacher. We all should be teaching in our homes to each other. Amen? Then there's the gift of encouragement. And by the way, I want to encourage you tonight. I'm about finished. I'm exercising that gift right now. Some of these sermons you can't run down the aisle with. It's just you've got to plot along and hear the Scripture. The gift of exhortation. Somebody say exhortation. I call it the gift of encouragement. It means to come alongside someone. The Greek word uh, paraklesis. Paraklesis is that word exhortation. And it's also a reference to the Holy Spirit. You remember that scripture that says, Jesus said, I will send you a helper. You remember that scripture? That's the same word, paraclesis, paracletus, the paracletos. That means somebody who comes, who comes alongside to help you out. You're carrying the load, and yet somebody says, hey, can I help you carry the load? Can I help you pray? Can I help you serve? Um, so an encourager, an encourager, man, we need people to encourage us. I was talking to my general manager at uh, Best Buy. He's new, he's young, and he's now the manager of a $17 million retail business. And uh, so we have our morning chalk talk. So we have one of our managers that is baptized in lemon juice and feels like that their responsibility is to correct 
the world and everything in it. So he's there and I'm there and Lazarus probably there and others are there. And this manager talks about, oh, we did good yesterday. So far, so good. We did good in this. Yeah, we did good in that. Yeah. And today we've got opportunities here. Yeah, we got opportunities there. Yeah. And I'm more, more they're talking the more I'm, yeah, this is encouraging. Yeah, I like that. Anybody else got anything to say? No, man, I'm like, boom, we're about ready. And then the general manager jumps in and says, hey, we're going to even do this. And he's a young guy, and he's, he's like real skinny, and he, he's like, man, we're going to do it. And, man, I'm about ready to do back, somersaults. But then we go back to manager lemon juice. And she said, I got one more thing to say. Y'all walk around here like you ain't got nothing to do, and y'all do this, and y'all do that. And I'm like, and everybody just walks out deflated. I told my general manager, I said, hey, psst, come here a second. I said, let me tell you something. You ever been to fireworks? He said, yeah. I said, let me tell you how fire. I said, if we had, if what, nothing what the other manager said was wrong. She didn't say what was wrong. Sometimes we do walk around and blah, 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 and don't, don't do what we're supposed to do. But it wasn't wrong. She just needed to put it at the front. Start out with the negative stuff. And then let's end with the positive. I said, you ever been to fireworks? Oh, yeah. And, you know, does, it, does the fireworks start out like this? And then at the end goes, <laughs> you reverse it. That first firework, pew. And everybody's like, wow, wow. And then pew, pew. And like, oh, my. And then finally, pew, 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 pew. And the other day, you know what my general manager said? Hey, Ricky, guess what? I said, what? He said, pew, 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 pew. That's what encouragers do. <laughs> do that to somebody, but don't spit on them, okay? All right. Whoever will use this microphone, please use hand sanitizer, amen? Nehemiah was an encourager. There are some people, and, and some, of you, um, some of you are more gifted in strong things, and you're more gifted, and you can see the details, and, and something. so you have to kind of work on being an encourager, because if not, you're always going to be a wet blanket. <laughs> That's what that manager was. She, they're a wet blanket, but even wet blankets can be an encouragement. Amen. Come on, got to get a witness out here, particularly if you're a leader. Amen. Particularly if you're a leader. I remember, <clears throat> I remember Philip uh, Pearson in uh, Royal Rangers class in 1999. And I was pastoring here when this used to be Living Waters. And so the church sent me down there to get Royal Rangers training. And that's the first time I met Philip Pearson. And he, he, he said something in the class I'll never forget. He said, when you got boys there and we're getting ready to have a big camp out, don't go up to the boys and say, hey, boys, anybody interested in going on a camp out? Mm -hmm. He's like, they're not going to want to go. This is Philip Pearson did this. He said, go to your class like this. Fellas, we're going to go camping. And we're going we're gonna to ride on alligators. And, and we're going to cut up snakes. And no, he didn't say all that. But, uh, I mean, we're going we're gonna to sleep outside in a freezing cold. And we're going to mess up the pastor's hair. I mean, we're going to have a blessed time. How many of you kids want to go? He didn't really say. I'm adding some of that to it, you know. Uh, you know, right? <laughs> But he got a good point, didn't he? It's the way you, you approach things. You got to have encouragement. You got to, hey, you come, you come to church tonight? Well, no. Are you going to be at church? I don't know. What? You're going to miss it? Oh, my goodness. We, we just got to get excited about it. Put it on Facebook. Share, the, share those posts. Get excited about your church. Be an encourager. Tell people that something's happening at Westmoreland. Something's happening in your life. Bishop Danny Nelson was talking last night to several preachers, and I was in the meeting last night, last night. And he was talking about, you, church, you pastors, you need to let people come up on the stage, and you need to let people tell what the Lord is doing, because sometimes people don't know what's going on. And I'm like, my goodness, we do that every Sunday. <laughs> Testimonies, hallelujah. I, that wasn't planned either. But God, thank God for encouragement amen and then there's the gift of giving i got just one more after this a couple more after this and i'm done um, the gift of giving we all know what that is there's some people who are called 
they have resources and means. They have been blessed. And God has touched them and said, I want you to build the kingdom of God. When I pastored here at Living Waters, when, when, I, when I drove up to this church in 1996 out there in that parking lot, I wish I, wish I, I wish I could just give you a picture of what this place looked like then. You ever seen those old Western movies where there's like this picture of this desert and a little tumbleweed goes floating by? The parking lot was not paved then. There was two little white lights up there. You, there were no houses like there are now. I remember when Brother Long told me to come down Tillman Road. He told me where the church was, and I remember driving into Wilson. I was like, oh, this is nice. Wilson's nice. I'm a Rocky Mount boy. I didn't know Wilson that good. And I was like, man, we're over here by driving down Ward Boulevard and all that. I said, man, this, he's sending me to a church in the city. And I remember I turned right on Tillman Road, right down here at the other end. I turned right, and the further we got down Tillman Road, the more depressing it looked. I said all that to say this. While I was there, just before I got there, God saved a man by the name of Walt Watson. Does anybody know what Brother Walt in our church? Now, you don't know him now. He's an older man. He's been very sickly. We need to pray for him. But Pastor Jerry, God blessed him. God gave him a business, and he basically, he is responsible for the first renaissance of this church. Pastor Jerry and the others took it to the next level when we came over from Westmoreland. But, but before... when. When God touched Brother Walt, Walt, and he would never, and Becky would kill me. I'm glad she's not here tonight. Don't tell her. Because they would kill me if I, because they don't want any glory. But I'm telling the steeple, Walt Watson put it up there. The, the, um, the stuff on the uh, air conditioner units out here, the little, little fences, he put that out there. The landscaping, the original landscaping, they put out there. I'm telling you, there's this stuff all over this church uh, that he had the gift of giving, and they still do to this day. They may not do it on the scale they did back then. What about uh, different people um, in the body of Christ? And one thing about givers, what about uh, Moses King? And, and he owned a Piggly Wiggly in Mount Olive. And he would give to small churches. Uh, and, and all over the denomination of the Pentecostal Church, uh, there is seed money from a man who said, I will give as God is getting. Now listen, you might think I'm not Walt Watson, I'm not Moses King, but you, we can all give generically. Can you say amen? amen? But there are some people that are called to give. And you may not know who they are. The Green family. Hobby Lobby. It isn't amazing that Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A are some of the most growingest businesses. Even if a sinner owns that store, God still blesses that store. Have you ever thought about that? That's the power of the gift of giving. Then there's the power of, there's the gift of leadership. Somebody say leadership. Leadership are those who, who, they're not preachers. They're not teachers. Now, teachers can be leaders. Preachers definitely are leaders, particularly in the office of the pastor. But they're those who have the ability to organize. Now, some of you, you do not have the ability to organize. There's some of you that might think you've got the ability to organize, but there are some who have a better gift to organization than others. Y'all love God tonight. That special ability... To understand clearly the immediate and long-range goals of a particular unit of the body of Christ. Leaders, men and women of stature, men and women of sound mind and understanding. They are like the sons of Issachar that know what needs to be done. And they're not always in the pulpit. And they're leaders in this church. Leaders that you can count on. Leaders that see and, and hear from the Lord. Leaders who are called. So your calling tonight may be to preach. I don't know. Your calling may be serving. I don't know. Your calling may be teaching. I don't know. Your calling may be encouraging. I don't know. Your, my Aunt Lola, was a, she was more of an encourager than a preacher. Your calling may be to giving. Your calling may be to leading. Your calling may be to mercy. We talked about that last time. You say there are people called to the gift of mercy. They sure are. You know who they are? They're the counselors in the church. They're the nursing home people. They're the hospital visit people. There's some of you that you have a heart to minister to people who are hurting. That's a calling. That's called the gift of mercy. I told you about Father Damien who was called to those who were sick in Hawaii. In closing, and everybody said hallelujah. But in closing,
But in closing, I, I, wanna, I, I specifically wanted to say this when everybody was in here. So I think everybody's in here now. Anybody else out there? Are you excited about the spiritual gifts? Are you wanting to go through the gate to all God has for you? Do you nobody should feel left behind. Nobody should think, well, I'm not educated enough, or I'm not a preacher, or I'm not ordained. I'm telling you, the gifts of the Spirit, they envelop all. We are all different. We are all unique. We're all special in a certain way. God has made us to be, be who we are, not ourselves, but our highest selves for a higher calling Flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Discover the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, ask God, Lord, have you called me to the gift of mercy? Am I, am I a person that's a, a person that can help people in counseling? And, and uh, do I have a gift to go to the hospital? And, and some people don't need a sermon. Some people just need encouragement. Amen. Some people just need the ministry of your presence. Am I called to be a leader? Whatever you're called to. And I'm going to tell you something. This would be another sermon for another day. God calls you to be part of a church. One thing about these spiritual gifts, you can't get it at home in the living room watching YouTube. Some of the holier than thou's that like, well, I'll just worship God in my, in my living room and on my laptop. No, sir, you're part, you're supposed, and if you're sick, yeah. If you're having a tough time, if you if you really got some things going on, uh, once in a great while. But we are to congregate. We are to come together. We are to be part of the body. The devil, oh, he really likes to he really likes to make make it, make it sad. He don't want us to come together. He wants to isolate us. You come, you have your little one or two there, or one or two or three there. There's something people are talking about. Well, we can just we ought to be like the New Testament. We ought to have churches in the houses. That's when we when the church really grew. No, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, the the church. You just have a church in your house and you'll never grow. Never. Zero. Never will grow. But you put your house and your house and my house and your house. You put us together and I promise you we can reach better, more together than we can individually out there. Now y'all looking at me like Nancy Pelosi again. Now, I know how y'all like it. I know how you're thinking out there. Y'all just looking all down. Now, come on now. We need to get together. Hallelujah. This is the body of Christ. Uh, this is where the gifts flow. Uh, we're not a perfect church, but we're a church being perfect. Uh, somebody say amen. Stand with me tonight before I get in more trouble. Amen. <laughs> now, here's what I want you to hear. Can I have your undivided attention? I want you to listen to this. This is the closer. This is my part. I'm closing my part. Whatever the pastor assigns me to do next, I'll do. We talk about the spiritual gifts. We talk about making a difference. Do you want to make a difference? Do you want God to use your spiritual gifts? Raise your hand if you do tonight. Now listen. Focus right here. Try to be as still as you can. When asked... To explain the impact of his life, William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army, replied in one striking phrase. Let me repeat. This man, William Booth, who turned the world upside down, began the Salvation Army, sent soldiers out into the street. We know the Salvation Army today, the ringing of the bells. He started in London, England. We need to have nobody. And they said to William Booth, how can you explain the impact of your life? He's a humble man, not an educated man. He answered this way. He said, Jesus Christ has all of me. Can you give him praise tonight? Don't sweat about tongues. Don't beat your head on the wall about prophecy. Just simply do this. Say, Jesus, you have all of me. Come on, lift your hands up and say, Jesus, you've got all of me. And Lord, when you have all of me... You just do the leading. You just do the teaching. You just do the tongues. You do the interpretation. You let me walk through the gate. Jesus, you have all of me tonight. Amen. And we thank you, Lord. He is 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 L
is Lord tonight. He is risen from the Jesus has all of me. Every knee shall bow. Every, Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. Hallelujah. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 